Hi, everybody. Welcome to ML Talks. Uh, today, our guest is Julia Angwin. Um, I think not a week goes by when I don't hear somebody say, we need more Julia Angwins. But, um, but there's only one, and we have her today. Uh, and Julia is a data scientist and a journalist. And it's a really important combination, as you'll soon find out. And she's a director's fellow of the Media Lab and working with us and has been helping us for about a year now, I guess. Um, and uh, as usual, this is being streamed. And so if you're watching this on the internet, you can tweet at uh, hashtag MLTalks. And we will, towards the end, be taking questions uh, from the audience and from Twitter. So uh, comment and feel free to ask questions. Um, but we'll start with some comments from and a presentation from Julia. Thank you. Hello, it's great to be here. Um, so as you can see, my talk is called Quantifying Forgiveness, which is sort of a strange title for a talk. And so um, I'm gonna start with just actually a little bit of background about who am I, why am I standing here, um, <laughs> which I think is always a little bit helpful, and then um, talk about forgiveness and then talk about quantifying forgiveness. Um, so I'm gonna start with just me. Um, I um, grew up in Palo Alto, and I really probably thought I was going to end up at a place like MIT. Um, I learned to program in fifth grade uh, because Steve Jobs was teaching everyone in the public schools in Palo Alto. This was my first computer. Um, I worked my summers at Hewlett Packard. I was really ready to go into um, the personal computer industry, which is what it was at that time. And I, um, I took a wrong turn. <laughs> I fell in love with my college newspaper and decided to go into journalism. And I thought, well, I'll just try it for a few years and maybe I'll go back to like, the real world of computers. Because when I grew up in Palo Alto, there were really two life choices, hardware, software. <laughs> and I was pretty much a software girl, but I didn't know there were other choices. So journalism was my rebellion. Um, I eventually ended up at the Wall Street Journal. I joined in 2000 um, <laughs> when, during the dot-com boom, which I guess now is ancient history, but it was hilarious. They were like, you know computers? We'll hire you to cover the internet. And I was like, well, anything in particular about the internet? And they're like, no, everything. <laughs> I was like, okay, seems fine. So um, they were just couldn't get enough people to write about technology. And I was there for 14 years, and then I went to ProPublica, where I am now, which is a nonprofit um, journalism startup, which, if you don't know about, it's um, investigative journalism started by the former managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. He left when Rupert Murdoch bought the paper. Um, so I want to tell you a little story about forgiveness in the real world based on my experience as a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. So I joined in 2000. I left in 2014. And I covered technology, right? Internet, whatever. <laughs> and during that time, I achieved what you know journalists sadly consider like their great dream is to get you know somebody locked up, right? You got you wrote such hard-hitting stories that somebody went to jail. And during that time, two people did go to jail because of my reporting. Strangely, they were both black men. Now. How many black men are in the technology business, right? Of all the executives that I wrote about, it is surprising to me that this is the outcome. So I'm going to tell you the stories. So first of all, when was this? 2003. Um, spam was a really big deal. And so I was like, I'm going to find a spammer. And <laughs> this was you know, exciting stuff. <laughs> So I worked with Earthlink, which was looking for a certain spammer. I tracked this guy down, um, found him at his home in Buffalo, knocked on his door. He didn't answer, yelled at me through the door. But um, I wrote a big story about like, you know, the hunt for spammers and how it was really difficult. And eventually, he was charged, and he was sent to prison for um, you know, the maximum sentence uh, for 14 counts of uh, identity theft for three and a half to seven years. So, you know, everyone in my office was like very excited. I felt it was a little weird, honestly, you know, but I was young. I was like, okay, it's journalism. A couple years later, I'm writing about AOL, and 
um, I actually heard a tip that somebody inside was embezzling. So I investigated, I found out there was a guy, he was the head of HR, um, also a black man. He's removed his pictures from the internet, so I can't <laughs> show you a picture of him. Um, and uh, he was caught, and AOL had been trying to cover it up, and so I wrote about it, and once I wrote about it, they brought charges, and he was, he was sentenced to 46 months in prison. Now, neither of these people were doing things, I mean, they were doing illegal things, right? Um, but think about what I wrote about that was the most illegal thing that I wrote about. The most illegal thing I wrote about was, at AOL, the round-trip deals they used to inflate their revenue so that they could increase their stock price. So they did these crazy deals during the dot-com boom where they would, um, instead of like contracting for their cafeteria vendor just to pay them to deliver food to the employees, they would say, actually, we're going to um, have you overpay you, and then you're going to buy ads. <laughs> And because these companies were only being measured on ad revenue, not on net income, not on profits. And so this was a scheme that actually inflated their revenue um, by billions of dollars. They paid $300 million in fines, and they're all doing completely fine. Okay, so Steve Case is worth 1.36 billion. He invests in all sorts of good causes. David Colburn, who led all those deals, actually is bringing lots of investment to Israel. And Bob Pittman, who actually was the architect of it all, is the chairman of um, Clear Channel, which is a huge outdoor billboard company, right? And so, like, you guys know this story, right? In your guts, we all know this story. This story is the story we all know, which is some people are forgiven for their crimes, and some people are not. And they kind of have similar traits. Some of them are white. <laughs> some of them are black. And that's just my anecdotal experience, but there's an enormous amount of data that supports that, right? And so that's my personal story of forgiveness, which is I feel bad about it for partic participating in this. And I feel sad when my fellow journalists want to get together and crow about who they got put away I don't want to participate in that. So I've started investigating forgiveness in the digital world, because actually the weird thing about automation and technology is it is auditable. And so we can see systemic bias in a way that we can't really see in human minds. And so I'm going to tell you about two different investigations I've done that have led me to some conclusions about algorithmic forgiveness. The first is, Oh, first of all, just, I forgot, algorithms are very important, and you know about them. They're in your lives all the time. <laughs> um, this is the Facebook blue feed, red feed, which, if you haven't seen, is a really great project by the Wall Street Journal. It just shows you what your news feed would look like um, in a blue state or a red state, basically in terms of your political leanings and how different your news looks. Um, so an algorithm that I've looked at is this one that predicts the risk of recidivism. So it's used across the nation in criminal justice to decide whether you're likely to go on to commit a future crime. And it asks you a whole bunch of questions, and they're input into some software, and it spits out a score, one through 10, are you risky or not? And then it's used for pretrial, uh, whether you're going to get out on bail. In many states, it's used for sentencing. And it's often used for parole. And in some places in California, actually, it's used within the prison system to sort you into medium and high risk. In, um, prisons. And so it's one of the most uh, popular, there are dozens of risk assessment tools in use in the criminal justice system, but this is one of the most popular ones. It's a proprietary software, not open source, not inspectable. Um, but I wanted to look at it, so we went and fought a FOIA battle in Florida and um, got the records of 18,000 people who had been scored by this program over a two-year period. So in Broward County, when you're arrested, every person who comes in for booking gets scored. And that's entered into the system. Interestingly, and then the pretrial judge looks at it when he is making the decision about whether to release you out on bail. Interestingly, everyone in Broward County that I talked to had no idea they were being scored. So they were just asked questions at intake, but they didn't know it was going into a scoring system. And the score is not described or just discussed in the pretrial hearing. The judge just gets it as information to be used. So the first thing 
that we did after fighting a five-month legal battle to get this data was just to look at it. What does it look like by race, for instance, since we know race is a big issue in the criminal justice system? And this is what it looks like. Basically, um, black defendant scores on the left are, were steady, one through 10, pretty evenly distributed. And white defendant scores were strangely clustered at the low end, right? So we thought, okay, if we were lazy, we could write a story right now saying the score is biased. But the truth is, who knows, right? Maybe every one of those people in the low risk category is actually Mother Teresa, they were picked up for littering, and they're the greatest people on earth. So we had to do a very sad thing, which was we had to look up the criminal records of 18,000 people and, um, and their criminal outcomes. So basically what we did was we found everyone's criminal history, and then we also found their actual recidivism outcomes. So we had to drop a lot of people from the sample because not everyone had been out for two years. But essentially we got down to a sample of 7,000 people for whom we had full records, meaning we had their criminal history, and then we also had two years worth of days that they were free because we took out the time that they were incarcerated for jail or for prison and added up, do we have a two-year stretch? So then we had this very nice sample, which, by the way, required an enormous amount of blood, sweat, and tears. Okay, <laughs> terrible amounts of blood, sweat, and tears. Joining databases on name and birth date is a task I would wish on no one. Okay, <laughs> um, the typos, there are terrible <laughs> aliases, all sorts of terrible issues. Um, but Broward County was very helpful because they had wanted to join these databases forever to see if their score was working, but they didn't have the time or <laughs> interest in doing it, so they actually hand-checked for us 1,500 records of missed names and birth dates. So in the end, we had, I think, nine months, 10 months after starting, we could run our five-minute long logistic regression, <laughs> which is the fun part. And what we found is that if you controlled for all the factors, so you basically, if you don't know what a regression is, it's just a way mathematically to try to create like a balanced pair to see what would the equivalent people, when you control for these, you remove all these other factors, there's, what would it, these people look like to, if they were similar. Okay, that's a terrible description of a regression, but anyways, close enough. Um, so we basically controlled for prior crimes for your future recidivism, your age and gender, meaning if you had two people who had those same exact things, their same prior criminal record, same outcomes, same age, same gender, what was their difference in scores? And you have this difference that was pretty stark, 45% more likely Black defendants were 45% more, more likely to be assigned a higher risk score with the same set of facts. Now, the problem is that it's really hard to write a news article that says 45% more likely. Editors don't like that. Readers don't like it. It's very hard to comprehend. What does 45% more likely mean? So the way to really describe this is in false positives and false negatives. So a false positive is somebody who was deemed to be positive, a high risk, but actually was not. So they were falsely accused of being high risk of future criminality. And false negative is obviously somebody who is falsely accused of being low risk, but it turned out to be high risk. And so then when you see, when you look at the false negative and false positive rates, is that there's this huge disparity. African American defendants are twice as likely to be given a false positive than a white defendant. And similarly, the white defendants are twice as likely to be a false negative than the black defendants. And so what was super weird about this was that the problem with these scores was all in the error rates. The score, did I forget to put it in? Oh, I forgot to put the slide. But anyways, the score is 60% accurate for both races. So that's a pretty crappy record, to be honest, like I'd be fired if my stories were 60% accurate, but like in the criminal justice system, this was considered like an okay finding. So we found it was 60% accurate, but all the bias was in this 40% error rate, so that one group was getting overscored and one group was getting dramatically underscored. And what that looks like in, in real life, and this is how you tell, this is how I, would, I tell the story, is I found people, right, who had a similar crime and described their situation. 
right? So here's a guy who's high ri low risk, Vernon Prater got a three, and Brescia Borden got an eight. Now let's look at their facts. So Vernon had previously been, first of all, they were both arrested for petty theft. Vernon had previously had two armed robberies and had already served a five-year sentence for armed robbery. The arrest he had for this score was he had shoplifted $80 worth of stuff from a CVS. And after this score, he went on to break into an electronics warehouse and steal thousands of dollars of goods, and he's serving a 10-year sentence right now. Brescia was also picked up for petty theft. Brescia was 18, and she was walking down the street with her friend, and they saw a kid's bicycle in the front yard of his house. They grabbed it and tried to ride it down the street. The mom came out and yelled, hey, that's my kid's bicycle. She came back and gave it back. However, in the meantime, a very nosy neighbor had called the police. And so her, she was arrested for petty theft. Actually, they charged her for burglary also, but later, I believe, dropped it. Um, she was scored high risk. Now, her previous offenses, I don't know. They're juvenile misdemeanors, so the juvenile records are sealed. But I do know that misdemeanors are not usually armed robbery, so I'm guessing they were less than Vernon's. And her subsequent offenses were none, right? And so this is exactly what a false positive and a false negative look like. She was a false positive. She was considered way more high risk than she turned out to be, and he was considered way more low risk than he turned out to be. And the thing that's weird about it is, in your mind, if you, somebody had said to you, what do you think these people are likely to do, <laughs> you probably wouldn't have made that mistake. But the computer made the mistake because of the way that its inputs are scored. Now, we don't know what the score, how they generate the score. This is a secret algorithm, <laughs> so they don't tell you. Um, I will tell you this, though, the night before we published, the company was very upset, obviously, about this story, and they said, okay, our, our secret equation is trade secret. You can't share it with anyone, but Julia, you can look at it. So they sent it to me. It was a linear equation <laughs> with, like, K, D, whatever, for constants, for, for the weights for the variables. Well, I don't know <laughs> how am I supposed to know if this is biased or not, right? And I would defy you, even if you had those, to prove the disparate impact, right? The thing is, you have to analyze the outcomes to really figure out how this is behaving. Um, and so really, what was interesting, and there's a lot of interesting things about this, and there's been many papers on this work, because we put out the data and the code for people to analyze, and I encourage you all to look at it if you haven't. But I think it really speaks to the idea that we think about bias, but what this was was unjustified forgiveness, right? Actually, this data, our intuition was correct, right? It's not the only part of the story, but it was actually a big part of the story, was that these people were getting a massive break, and it wasn't justified. So I think it's interesting to frame it around forgiveness, because I think our also that's intuitively what we understand to be going on. That's what I understand to be going on based on my own experience of covering the criminality of the tech industry, which is like basically those three examples that I know about. Um, so I want to tell another story about another algorithm that we were able to quantify. So this is an algorithm that predicts the risk of car accidents. It's the one that car insurance companies use to set your premiums. So Insurance is supposed to be a risk-based metric where you contribute to the pool based on how much risk you're bringing to the pool. So we decided to test that because, in fact, there's been long observed that minority neighborhoods get higher rates, and no one has ever been able to explain why. The car insurance companies say those neighborhoods are more risky but no one has been able to measure it. So we decided, my team, because we just hadn't had enough fun joining the criminal justice databases that we would try another gigantic data project. So we um, went and actually worked with Consumer Reports, which bought us a data set, which was 30 million um, quotes for car insurance by zip code across the US. And we bought different driver profiles. And this we could have obtained by reading every car insurance filing in every state um, ourselves and calculating, but it was easier to buy. 
And um, then what we did was we filed a public records request in all 50 states for the actual risk of actual payouts that insurers have made by zip code. Now, tragically, only four states collect that data. Um, so we could only analyze it in four states. But we still had four states, so we looked at California, Illinois, uh, Texas, and Missouri. And we compared premiums versus payouts for a single safe driver. So essentially, controlling the risk of the driver, what do you see in the difference between premiums and payouts? Because car insurance companies have this extra factor that they, additionally to your safe driver profile, to your driving profile, they choose to put a, a certain surcharge or discount based on your zip code. This is something that they're allowed to do, and so they base it on this idea that some zip codes are less safe than others. I don't personally understand this because, I don't know about you guys, but I do drive outside my zip code. That's the whole reason I have a car. <laughs> but anyways, I guess this is their, their fun times. So, one, so basically, we wanted to remove all things other than zip code and see what was the difference. And so we did this horrifying chart, which I'm sorry if any of you have ever looked at it. Um, we clearly need some data visualization help. But we did um, the average prediction, <laughs> of the average of the minority um, premiums over non-minorities. Oh my god, this is the worst. And um, looked at, here, let me just go to the next one. So basically, the risk versus, the risk is the x-axis, which is the actual payouts, right, scaled from least amount to most. So the farthest risk is on the right-hand side. And then the premiums are on the y-axis, so the increase in premiums. And what you see, the red, the linear line, is minority neighborhoods. They actually track risk. So the premiums go up as risk goes up. What you see in most, and this was just one uh, company. We did this per company. So this was one company in Missouri. This is uh, Geico uh, in Missouri. But what we saw, we saw the same pattern in every, almost every zip co in every company. Um, you, what you see is an unexplained difference, reducing risk for white neighborhoods. So what this showed was there was an unexplained discount in white neighborhoods that didn't track risk. And that was a very surprising result. Because everyone, again, thinks about bias, right? But it was an unexplained discount. Um, and this is what it looks like in real life. So Otis Nash plays $190 a month for Geico car insurance. He's had no accidents. He works two jobs. He's a uh, you know, really diligent father and a really lovely person who I hung out with in Chicago. He lives in East Garfield Park, which I don't know if you guys know Chicago, but it's one of those um, really kind of run-down West neighborhoods that is filled with graffiti and trying to emerge, but, you know, what we call the inner city. Now, this is Ryan. Ryan lives in really Wrigley Park, and he is, like, it's a classic bars and a yuppie people neighborhood, and he pays $55 a month for his Geico car insurance, even though his spouse recently had an accident. And the thing is that the difference, really, a lot of it was this base rate. So they, these insurers have set a base rate for property damage in East Garfield Park of $753 a year and in Wrigley Park of $376 a year, so literally twice as much in East Garfield Park. And when we looked at the payouts, they are actually lower in East Garfield Park than in Wrigley Park, right? So this is not explained by risk. And this difference in their prices is largely driven by this crazy different in property damage base rates. And the reason is because Chicago, actually, weirdly, tried to get rid of redlining in the car insurance market. So they said, no one can ever change the, the, um, the non-property damage rates by zip code. So they lump all of their changes into the property damage part of it, uh, despite the fact that the risk doesn't support it. So once again, this is a question of forgiveness, right? We have this gap, and this is a gap where we've chosen to give one kind of group of people a pass. 
And so I guess I would just like to challenge all of you when we talk about bias to also think about forgiveness because the data suggests, not always, but in these two particular cases, surprisingly, that it was an unexplained discount not based on risk that was really the problem. And so I think we should think about that as a society, um, that that's one way to think about the challenges we're facing. And I guess I would just want to leave it with the fact that I really am thankful in a weird way, though, that we're choosing to automate some of these biases because I think we need to collectively see them. And the ability to audit them is really powerful, right? And we have made change through these. California has forced um, several companies to change their rates as a result. Um, and there's bills pending in other states as a result of it on car insurance. The criminal justice field is debating heavily the use of these risk assessment scores. So I am hopeful that the, this kind of data can help change the debate. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. So I, I wanted to sort of just start with the last thing that you presented which was uh, forgiveness in the, in the Chicago um, uh, premiums. Well, first of all, what, what uh, you, like, who did it? Who did it? Is it the data? Is it somebody going in there and being racist and changing oh, the yeah. premiums? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What, we, what, we see, what we found, and really we have the best evidence for this in California, because the companies have to give more information there. Mm -hmm. But what we found in California, which I think is likely to be true in the other states as well, is that actually the, the real problem was that in white, a lot of these whiter neighborhoods were rural and there wasn't a lot of data. And so they didn't have enough data to really make a true risk calculation, mm -hmm. so they guessed. Mm -hmm. So in California what they did was there was a loophole in the law where they could string together a bunch of zip codes that were neighboring and use so you, it was like transitive. You could take your neighbor's, neighbor's risk score mm -hmm. <laughs> risk, <laughs> and put it in yours. And so they were just transferring one low risk and, and assuming that it was spread around. Um, and so the regulators have stepped in and said, you know, mm -hmm. they're going to have to work harder to justify their use of those neighboring zip codes risk in mm -hmm. places where they have sparse data. Yeah. But I actually think it was like they didn't have enough data, so they made a guess. And their guess was, look, these are a bunch of nice white people. <laughs> So, uh, so, 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 because the, the Chicago one um, yeah. is slightly different, right? Because they yes. do probably did have data, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure why, because Chicago there is plenty of data. Um, there's a lot of history in Chicago, yeah. <laughs> redlining, and maybe yeah. you know one thing that is interesting when I talk to the insurers because I've talked to them extensively about it. There is. Um, no one's ever said this directly, but there's been a lot of like, you know, Julia, it's hard to change people's rates they might leave. And so, uh, uh, like, I suspect there may be some like, oh, these people might shop around. Right. And so we want to keep it low. So, so, so in a way, they were just obscuring. It, so, so, so it could, it's hard to tell whether it's crappy data, bad algorithms, or just somebody hiding behind sort of this veil of data and doing, and fiddling being corrupt. It's, you, you, you can't really tell. Or, I mean, I actually think it could be lost leader, right? Like, you know... So just marketing. Yeah, it's marketing. Like, you've got to get those white people in because they're going to bring more people or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and, and in, in insurance, I mean, as you're starting to poke into this, because um, I, I was just reading a paper about the use of FICO scores, the, 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 uh, the credit scores for really shady things like um, targeting... Uh, 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 predatory um, product sales based on household and stuff like that. But it's, it's really at the edge of the law. In, in, in the, stuff, the stuff that you showed in the, in, in the insurance, is, that, is any of that illegal? I mean, is it regulated? Are they doing the right yeah, thing? Yeah, it's interesting. So what I learned about insurance is it's, um, I don't know if you know this, they have an exemption from antitrust law. So yeah. Congress gave them an exemption, and so they're only regulated by the states. And... I think it's fair to say that a lot of states are not really heavily regulating them. California is the most aggressive regulator. Mm -hmm. Illinois has chosen um, 
I'm sure it has nothing to do with the fact that State Farm and Allstate are based there, that to entirely not regulate. Um, they don't check anything. You can do any, I could start an insurance company tomorrow there. And they don't pay tax either, right? <laughs> well, think. nobody pays taxes. <laughs> <laughs> well, rich people don't pay taxes. Right? Um, um, so, but, so I guess one of the things that's interesting is as you start to shine the light on these things, are the regulators responding and say, oh, wow, we didn't know. Maybe we better do something about it. I mean, we've had a really constructive dialogue with California. Um, they're the most well-staffed regulatory insurance regulatory office. They're um, really, uh, they have tons of actuaries. I think they have hundreds of actuaries. And so they mm -hmm. take their job really seriously. And we um, had some really good back and forth about um, the data and the real technicalities, and they mm -hmm. took it to heart. Um, Illinois, Missouri, and um, Texas said, whatever, guys, thanks for your paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't find the modern untouchables there, ready to take down crime. No, but I mean, I think it has, um, you know, it has given some conversation. There's these groups of the National Association of Insurers and stuff. So I think it's being talked about, mm -hmm. but um, it's a hard industry to, to make change yeah. in. And, and I think you, you were mentioning before in a conversation we were having that people had anecdotal evidence of this, yep. but the data actually gave a lot of um, uh, energy to the conversation. Is it, do, you, do you find yeah. that true broadly? Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that's sort of depressing about a lot of my findings is that people are like, well, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, of course, this risk score is gonna be biased against black defendants. Like, of course, they're redlining. And yet, it's still important to prove it, right? right. Because even if you think it's true, it's, we need the data to support mm -hmm. it. And so um, sometimes these stories can feel a little underwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, my editors are like, oh, whatever, like we know that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and yet, it, I think the real benefit, I think, of we always release our data and our code is that I find that that is what propels the argument. Like we're in a world mm -hmm. now where you can talk about whatever, but until you lob data over the fence, mm -hmm. you don't get a real policy dialogue going. I, I heard uh, Kathy O'Neill, um, who's the author of um, Weapons of Mass Destruction, on the radio the other day, using the term math-splaining. <laughs> 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 that when you pull out the data and hit people with it, it's really yep. hard, right? Um, and because the, 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 the companies have been doing this forever, right? They, and, and even now, I mean, I think Kathy was telling me, no, it wasn't Kathy, it was uh, another friend, Sendel, was telling me that, like, even, like, just unemployment rates we're measuring right now people who are looking for jobs that can't find them, right. but we're not including people with disabilities, people who've given up. And so if you look at those, it's actually going crazy. And so the other part, you were talking about visualization, is how you present the data. Yeah. And I think you as a journalist are presenting the data in a specific way to sort of shine the light on the bad guys. Um, but that's also really interesting and important and, and, and par partially also where you get criticized too, right? Because mm -hmm. You obviously have a point of view that you're using the data to expose, and the company will come back and say, no, 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 her data only shows this and it doesn't right. show that, right? Right. I mean, the insurers say, look, Julia, um, you're using the wrong data. You're using the average losses per zip code. So what we got from FOIA is the average of all insurers and all their losses on average per zip code over a three-year period. And they're like, our individual losses could be a huge outlier. However, they don't share those. That's secret data. So they're like, well, we have secret data that shows that everything is awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, well, fine, let's sh share, share that. Let's right. talk about it, but they don't want to. But you know, all these data conversations always come down to that, which is like, you're looking at the wrong pool. And that's why I feel so strongly about journalists collecting their own data. We need to know what we're looking for and go get it, because received data sets have the people who collect them, there's a reason they don't collect it if they don't want to know it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you have to go get it yourself. Right. It's the don't ask what you don't want to yes. know, right? Uh, but, but let's I want to talk about some of your criticisms too because you're, I think the first presentation about the risk scores, I mean, that was such a huge impact that I think the company responded and then academics responded and then you responded and I sort of want to go yeah, through sure. some of these because I think it's actually interesting because the word bias also, we just... I'm teaching a course with Jonathan Zittrain, and actually we had Kathy O'Neill, and last, uh, on Tuesday, was about algorithmic bias. And bias can mean so many things, right? It can mean a point of view, it can mean um, 
unfairness, it can mean uh, data that's skewed. And so, you know, one, I think one of the criticisms was that if you optimize for the thing that you were pointing out, which is the false um, positives, then the accuracy rate would go down and that you can't optimize for both. And the argument, I guess, from the company was we're more concerned with making sure that we get the number of the, the risk of the recidivism risks right and the people who end up a little bit longer in jail don't matter as much. Is that roughly? Yeah, they, their basic argument was um, it's 60% accurate for both black and white defendants and we've optimized the algorithm so that it's fair in its predictive accuracy. And we don't care, we don't think your idea of fairness where you think that like this disparity in the error rates matters, right? And that's a point of view. And it's a point of view that is shared by that whole field. The current, you know, all of the risk assessment scores are, are designed this way. And it comes from, you know, a history that they've had. But, you know, if you talk to people in medicine, obviously you're not going to not pay attention to the false positives. Those are the people who die because your medicine is bad, right? You, that's a huge part of your decision in, in diagnostic tests. And so, I think it's like a semantic argument. We are pointing out that they've chosen a definition of fairness that has this disparate impact in the error rate. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, well, that's not a fair thing because if you change the error rate, you would change this optimization mm -hmm. for fairness at predictive accuracy. But like, I feel like in the criminal justice context to say that you're totally fine with false positives when the whole point of due process mm -hmm. is actually the default to innocence. And so I find that a really hard argument, but that is the argument that mm -hmm. they're making. And then there's the other argument that even with that, they're not as bad as his judges. Is that? Well, yes. And that people say that to me all the time you know what, judges are so much worse, Julia, you got no idea. And I'm like, that is true, I have no idea. Please present <laughs> me the data and I will analyze it. And I mean, I think that is probably true of some judges and probably some are better. And it, it's a question of how do you do that controlled study and I'm not necessarily the one to do it. I couldn't, you know, in the jurisdiction that I was looking at at Broward, they use the assessment. There was no controlled judge who wasn't using the assessment that I could compare outcomes with. And I think that's important academic work, but it doesn't in any way take away from the fact that the score itself is biased. Mm -hmm. And also it's kind of like fair for who, right? right. And, 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 I mean, it, it, and, and I think that's the weird thing about the word fair. Everybody uses a, like they want a bit, it to be fair for them. Yep. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a weird question like just on, on fixing bias, uh, this is a slightly sort of philosophic question. It's like, is your goal to eliminate, like what are you solving for? Who are you, I mean, okay, you're, you're a journalist, so you're trying to be neutral and shine the light. But, <laughs> I'm but, objective, but, Joey. Obje but but I, 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 wonder, I wonder, you know, like if you have, I think um, Kathy O'Neill was talking about um, um, child abuse, right? So you have these predictors now that try to figure out which families are um, beating their children. Yep. And so a false positive where you take a child away from a perfectly fine family or a false negative where you don't intervene, right? You have very different outcomes, both horrible, yes. right? I mean, obviously accuracy is important, but assuming you're gonna have one of the, you're gonna lean one way or the other, how should we be deciding what, what I mean, yep. and, then, and then again, I think their view would be similar to the criminal justice, but our tools are still better than what we have now, which is we can't predict anything and we just wait for a phone call, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I think that's right. I think, um, I don't know if you've read Virginia Eubank's book, Automating I Inequality, yeah. but she's really good on this point. And she, she talks about the fact that, you know, these child abuse um, algorithms are themselves, too, it's too small a lens on the problem, mm -hmm. right? Child abuse and neglect is usually a symptom of poverty. And so, if you were to bring some resources to bear to help the family, maybe that would probably be better. But instead, it's all about predicting this tiny narrow thing, which is actually really, really hard to predict, right? Mm -hmm. So predicting human violence is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. One thing I didn't talk about is we, there's a score that Compass had for violence, so they predict violent recidivism. It was only 20% accurate. 
It had the same exact bias. Wait, what does what twenty percent accurate mean? That <laughs> means eighty percent inaccurate, right? Yeah, that would right? be right. <laughs> so that means worse than a coin toss. Yes. So it's like well, when <laughs> so predictive accuracy is when you predict it will happen. I see. Twenty percent of the time, you're right. I see. Okay, okay so it's a little better than. Well, so it's, it's not. A, it's, you can't compare it to a coin it's toss. It's not the same as a coin toss, but it's not a good number. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so sixty percent for the recidivism is also not, not, it's a, not a good, good number, number. Right. Right. The industry's gold standard, by the way, for criminal risk scores is seventy percent. They think they're winning when they get to that point. Okay. Um, but I would like to say that previously, in I looked back in the literature in the 70s, um, psychologists used to make these uh, dang, you know, violent predictions. They would be brought in, is this person going to be violent? They'd interview them. And they were uh, judged to be only 53% accurate. And so they were actually taken, like that was decided to be not good enough. <laughs> and now we've like come with this automation that is only 20%. Interesting. And, and then I think you mentioned it, and, and Chelsea's in the audience, and she's gone around interviewing people. We, um, your article actually spurred the creation of, I think we're calling it, um, uh, uh, he, he, how? Was it humane, hum, humanizing um, AI in law? Um, <laughs> but they've been running around um, talking to jurisdictions and doing ethnographies. But one of the things that I think she found was that the data is just crappy. Yes. Right? I mean, you're underpaid clerks entering data, mm -hmm. and it's, what, how much of it I mean, do you think is just that? Oh, for sure. I mean, first of all, the data is crappy in the sense that, the really large sense, which is like even what they're trying to obtain, which is the questions on the risk score are, do you live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of crime? Has anyone in your family ever been committed, convicted of a crime? So already it's like, Anyone, plenty of people had written before we did this analysis, like this is obviously going to be very biased against poor and minority neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the outcome yeah. of what they say recidivism in is, is actually a new arrest. Now, arrest is not the same as a new crime. Right. A new arrest is obviously people get arrested for all sorts of things. You know, Chelsea and I were outside joking that we could stand on the street corner and smoke marijuana and we would probably never get arrested, we would, no matter how hard we try, because we're two white ladies, right? And so... I hope you didn't try. No, we didn't try. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's just, we know that there's over-policing yeah. and over-arrests so, in some communities. Well, so, so I guess I have to be a little bit more um, technical in my terms, because crappy can mean several things, right? Okay. It could mean just noisy, or it can be socially crappy, which right. is sort of what you're saying. So I guess the question is, and this is something actually Karthik uh, is working on, um, which is, uh, let's assume you had completely accurate data mm -hmm. um, and that you were predicting 100%, mm -hmm. right? Would it be fair? Right, so that's a question I think that is hard for me to answer. I personally feel very uncomfortable with um, I think that we should all really question the use of a future crime in the sentencing of a current crime, right? Like just on a philosophical level, whether or not it's true, right? So I think that's like a, bur like that's a barrier we all have to cross as a society together and be okay with. I'm queasy about that, right? Mm -hmm. I believe in human change and redemption, if, you know? And so I guess I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not really on board with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have to make these decisions as a society. We've made a lot of really terrible and really good decisions together as a society. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 the, and the work that Karthik is working on is to try to stop focusing so much on prediction, but to focus on causal inference and trying to understand the underlying causes and address them and try to maybe lower overall crime or reduce income disparity rather than just more accurately throwing <laughs> criminals in jail. Right. And the other thing, and, and, and this is again something that Kathy O'Neill talked a lot about, but like if you look at, first of all, there, there are two sh slides that were pretty amazing, which was the relationship between arrests and crimes. And I think she was saying something like homicides, only half the people are caught. Mm -hmm. And that most of the people who are committing crimes aren't arrested. And most of the people who are arrested aren't actually committing violent crimes. Yep. And so the relationship between bad crim crimes and arrests are sort of not really correlated, yep. but arrest records are what you're using for predictive right. policing. And obviously, if the police are being guided to neighborhoods where there are lots of arrests, they're going to make a lot of arrests, so they're going to find 
their share of criminals, and they're not going to catch you guys smoking pot on the corner. And then it's going to actually be a self-fulfilling prophecy that you're going to be a recidivism statistic because you're much more likely to get arrested if you live in the neighborhood where you have high recidivism score, and then it becomes this sort of self-reinforcing positive feedback loop right. that just cause, like, makes you into a criminal. And, right. and so even if it were accurate, I think when you think about systems dynamics, what happens is it just creates these reinforcements which I think confound the social reinforcements we already have, which yeah. is poor people don't get the opportunities and so on and so forth. So, you know, could these algorithms be actually not only just representing societal bias, but amplifying them at some, you know, terrible rate? Yeah, I mean, I think they are. And I think the one, the thing that, I, that is slightly hopeful, I think, is that in that moment we are in right now where they're just starting to be automated and amplifying, if we can catch them mm -hmm. and diagnose the problem and we all could decide together that that's wrong and fix it, so, there's an opportunity. So, so, so let me poke the <laughs> phrase you just said, decide together. How does that work? Well, you know, democracy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we decided together on our president. We decided together on a wall. I mean, so, so I think one of, the, one of the worries that I have is if you have a somewhat clunky situation outside and you're pointing out these biases, um, first of all, you have to actually have people think that they're bad, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you're on the... If you're some white guy that's saying, I'm getting lower insurance rates and I get out of jail free card. <laughs> right. what, what's wrong with this, right? right. So, so I guess the question sort of is, do you think of yourself as a uh, you know, left-leaning liberal person trying to hack the system towards your own personal agenda mm. of making things less biased in, against the popular norm of society, mm. you know? No, I don't. I actually see myself <laughs> as a data terrorist. I just throwing <laughs> data. Uh -oh. I'm like, guys, uh, it's not what you're now on a terrorist list somewhere. <laughs> I think I was already, okay. but um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I really, I do take my role as a watchdog seriously, and I see that as my role in life, and I really enjoy it. I like to be the thorn in the side. <laughs> yeah. And you are. Um, <laughs> it's working out. Because <laughs> um, so, and, and I was on a, a, a mailing list, and I won't say who, but somebody was arguing quite eloquently that um, we should just ban all um, algorithms and, and automation in the criminal justice system. Yeah, Do you think that's I too mean, extreme? or? I don't know. I mean, I think the problem with the criminal justice system is it's... Um, having spent so much time, um, you know, as a technology reporter, and then I spent like a year and a half basically in jail and prisons talking to people and, um, and people who had gotten out, um, the terribleness, the, the terribleness of it is so much deeper than algorithms mm -hmm. um, and so indefensible on so many levels that um, I guess I'm... I'm, I just don't think algorithms are the only problem, and I yeah. think it's a really complex problem. But, I mean, I, I, I was so horrified, right? The, there's this trend now that you can't ever have human contact, so all these jails that I visited just have, you can only Skype with your relatives, you'll never be able to see them in person. Mm -hmm. I, many jails are being built without any natural light and no outdoor space, and you mm -hmm. can be in there for two years. It's, it's just shocking. Yeah. But then there's this, um, I mean, being on a, a couple of foundation boards, I know that foundations and society likes metrics. And I think one of the things that both the Koch brothers and the left wing have agreed on is that incarceration is bad, that we're trying to lower jail populations. Mm -hmm. And so we have foundations like the Arnold Foundation that are funding a lot of these risk scores because they, they do seem to reduce jail populations. Mm -hmm. um, and that that feels good to both the people who want to save money as well as the people who don't want to see people in jail. But, um, you know, we were t talking to a judge recently, and I think this is another thing that Chelsea's been working on, but they're being let out with all these conditions, with um, GPS ankle bracelets, um, curfews. Uh, you know, one of the judges said, you know, these are kids who make, have gotten stuck with minor infractions because they're not good at following the rules. And then the lawyers come in and bargain less jail time, but with tons of rules that they're never going to be able to follow and so they're going to get dragged back in again and so it's sort of interesting to see that as you optimize for a single score 
which seems like a good proxy for bad because these jails seem so horrible, you may be just smearing the problem around into other places that aren't being measured. And, and I, I think as a data scientist, that's also, to me, an interesting question is because, you know, are, are you looking at the right numbers and could you be reducing the problem to something that maybe um, isn't representing actually the yeah, I mean, issues. I think it's a really good point. What, I mean, my basic feeling about these algorithms, having looked at them for so long, is that um, the reason they exist is because uh, people need a, to tell the public that they're only letting low-risk people out. So it's part of the movement to end mass incarceration, and that is a very good goal. And this is basically the political step that people feel is necessary to accomplish that goal, is to tell the public, look, we've, science is here, don't worry, science is on it, and science says these are the cool people, they'll be out and you'll be safe, right? And so it's a political story more than it is a data story, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The data's there just to solve that political problem. Yeah, and actually, um, Kate Crockford from the ACLU's here, but she, um, like, there was a, you're not from Boston, but in Boston there was a, algorithm that uh, really, actually, uh, 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 MIT team won for scheduling the busing. And actually, the team that won, I, I read some of the stuff that they, they had um, talked about before, they were actually a very thoughtful team who wanted to go out and, and talk to the community and figure out what they wanted to optimize for and stuff like that, but they created an optimization algorithm for school busing. Um, but then the outcome of the algorithm was a terrible uh, outcome where you had kids, elementary school kids starting at, I think, 7.15 in the morning, getting dumped out of school at 1.30, and the parents were in an, an uproar. And I think the mayor's office initially said something like it was trying to optimize for high school learning outcomes, right? And then later they said something like, oh, but we were also optimizing for um, cost. And maybe they were saying, oh, and we would save the money, and then we'd pour it into pedagogy or something. But, but, but in any case, a lot of people are blaming the algorithm, right? And I think the thing that Kate um, allowed me to write one sentence and co-author an op-ed for her um, <laughs> that she wrote. Um, and, uh, but but it was, it was the, the point was, don't blame the algorithm. It's the political system that created the optimization that the algorithm was set for, right. you know, optimize for money over the convenience of the families. And so I think that's, the, that's why I was kind of pointing at um, we should all decide, right? I think that's the really big meta problem is we don't really seem to be good at figuring out how to decide and I think part of what you're doing is you're using math and science, not math and science, I guess math and science, and algorithms and data to make it so that we can see what's going on right. and reflect so that we can then inform ourselves and then decide things. And I think the, what, the problem, though, is that the deciding part seems to still be somewhat broken. I right? agree. I guess the reason I, can't, I, I keep like kind of pushing back on that is that yeah. essentially I'm just really good at problems and I suck at solutions. So like, let's just be real. Like, I am really good at diagnosing problems, and I guess I just want someone to pick up that ball and run with it. Like, I have my skill set. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I, but I do think that correctly diagnosing a problem, you know, until we did this math, people didn't realize it was the optimization of the algorithm for fairness. And so I'm glad we brought that to the table, and I, I hope that people can thread the needle mm -hmm. from there. Um, and so I feel like my, my value and the work that I do and the work that I hope more journalists will do like this and more activists is by bringing really quantification to these problems, it makes it addressable, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, Facebook, everybody's writing articles like, Facebook is so bad, they're so big. That's not an addressable problem, right? And the addressable problem is the thing I showed, which is like, you can buy um, ads targeted to Jew haters on Facebook because they had an ad category, right? And then they just took that <laughs> ad category away. Like, so I'm in the world of addressable problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I guess in the case of something like Facebook, it's their job to address the problem. And so it's, it, I think that's, I think, right. you know, they, they are thanking you probably somewhere for their, mm, their service. I don't know about that. <laughs> but. Um, but I think when it involves a political system, it's a little bit uh, yeah. tricky. Um, um, we're sort of at the half, the, the uh, uh, comments part. I, I don't know if there's, there's ball. does anybody have any questions? Maybe Kate and then okay. we'll, we'll, It's okay. a throwing situation. Oh, oh my oh, God. Oh. <laughs> you okay? there, there's actually a little warning underneath that says don't throw at people's head. But. <laughs> oh. Okay, is this on? Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry about um, that. Hey, guys. So I just had a couple thoughts. One is that um, it strikes me that, you know, if we are producing risk assessment tools to, for example, 
uh, say there was a risk assessment tool in the criminal justice context, that instead of determining whether or not someone would go to a cage or remain in a cage, would determine whether that person needed maybe direct cash assistance, right? Um, do you need help getting to court, for example? Here's a bus pass. Or um, so, in other words, you know, it seems to me that the risks involved with risk assessments can be substantially lowered, if not eradicated entirely, if the the action that is taken at the end is something that it doesn't matter if there's a false positive or a false negative because it doesn't hurt anyone to give them you know, health care or um, a babysitter or a bus pass or something like right. that. And that maybe we should start using risk assessment tools in those types of situations because um, it'll help us get more data about how they actually work and stop using them in contexts where a false right. positive could be really detrimental. So that's how they're used in Canada. So they were first developed in Canada. And the people who developed them all had this intent, which is like, they're actually called risk and needs assessment. So what are your needs? And basically, um, in Canada, you, they actually try to meet your needs. When they came to the US, they still have the needs part of it. But the judges that I've spoken to say, look, I only have three treatment beds for drug right now. And so I can't give it to all the people who need it, right? So it's nice to have this need section but also the needs, at least with the compass, are like in green and kind of like woo-woo. And the, <laughs> the risk part is like these giant red, like high risk. You know, and so the judges are also really scared of being that statistic where they let the person out, right? So right. they are just guided by the risk portion. I will say this, the, in the California prisons, they are only using the needs right now. And the, um, I went and spoke at San Quentin, and everyone there knew their compass risk score like immediately. And they were like, it's actually good to get high risk because you get more services. And so they were fine, um, although they weren't super happy when I told them about the bias in it. But then they were like, whatever, we all have high risk scores anyways. <laughs> right, but nobody cares, like you're saying, if yeah. getting a high Correct. risk score it didn't have means any you get to go to the gym for longer or exactly. you get like, special classes or something. Right. So that was one thought. Another thought was that, just like you said, Julia, you know, the reason I think that we are turning to these tools is because of things like the Willie Horton problem. And for folks yeah. who don't remember Massachusetts political history, there was a crisis here when Governor Dukakis uh, let somebody out of prison and he killed someone. Um, and as a result of that, I think judges are terrified of the political consequences, especially in places where ju judges are elected, of letting people out of prison. So we as a society really have to change the political zeitgeist so that judges aren't relying on tools like this to sort of deflect personal responsibility because they're scared of, of what may result from, you know, a bad decision. Um, and then I had a question, which is, how did folks in Broward County respond to your work, and did they actually change something about how they're using the um, system? Well, they were really happy because they were like, look, we were wanting to join these databases for a long time. <laughs> So thank you for doing that work. And also, by the way, we are not going to change anything. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, OK. You know, they were like, look, um, the company that built this score says that you're using the wrong definition of fairness. And I was like, OK. You know? Wow. Okay. Yeah, and just I wanted to add one thing to what you were saying. And is I think we work with the town of Chelsea. And they have this thing called the hub, which is not only the police department, but other social services and supports and I think that they're not using the risk scores but they're 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 trying to address the underlying causes and this is sort of Karthik's causal stuff and mm -hmm. you know there's really interesting just like failure to appear right could be like you said all these different things and so I think when you're looking especially at the pretrial stuff um, if you could just get one layer deeper and figure out what the failure was then you could separate the people who could be helped by a little bit of, um, you know, bus money, or, you know, maybe they need some medical support, or maybe they, you know, they're out committing a crime, and what they all turn out as failure to be. It's kind of like when diabetes was one thing, and so, right. so I think a lot of it could be addressed by having more data. But my concern still about something like that is if we created a massive database that identified all the needs and all the vulnerable people. You could use it to help the people, but you could also use it to discriminate against the people and to sell, um, you know, for-profit uh, for universities, um, you know, um, spam to these people. And so, so that's, I think, the other fear that I have about creating massive databases to help people is you can use the same databases to hurt them, right? And do you want to, and then we'll, sorry. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, this is pretty interesting, and uh, it's pretty provocative to think 
as a problem of forgiveness instead of bias, and I, I think it has uh, quite a bit of value. So you were saying that you're not good at uh, finding solutions, uh, but identifying problems. That's the first step, that's good. But uh, let's see if I can try to help in uh, identifying some solutions. What you're finding, you, you need the definition of uh, the definition of fair, of, of, for, for fairness. Uh, what exactly is fair? Well, if you identify that for a particular problem you have two communities whose experience follow two different distributions, like the um, case with the insurance companies in which black neighborhoods had this kind of increase uh, in premiums where the white had uh, some kind of uh, better forgiveness. Maybe fairness would not be to actually make the white communities go up and start paying as much as the black communities, but have as a policy that whenever you have communities having different experiences, just map to the better one. Maybe that's something that can be constituted as a policy. What mm -hmm. do you think? I mean, I'm definitely in favor of more forgiveness instead of more punishment. I agree with you. I think when you're talking about companies' profit margins, like their likelihood of <laughs> adopting that might be low. But um, I, you know, but I, I would, I would do that. That's why nobody's letting me run any kind of profit yeah. company. And, and, <laughs> and I've heard that a number of times that we're willing to try to be more fair as it does, as long as it doesn't cost us money. Right. right? Exactly. Which is kind of a weird. Well, I think you have to throw it. And, and to actually, somebody. we're going to go here okay. and then behind, and then to Judith. Uh, thank you. It was very interesting because it illustrated structural inequality in a quantifiable way. And the first question that comes to mind is when we do that, who do we serve and what do we serve? Sometimes measuring and rating and demonstrating is really uh, the easier, even though it's very complex as you said that, but the easier task when we look at Constitu constituting fairness, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, in order to be fair, not necessarily we have to be more specialized in analyzing data, but more, as you said, more specialized in inventing new criteria. How can we resolve the issues? For example, can we quantify the economic loss to society for all the biases that are being done? Can you do that? Mm -hmm. It's a question. Um, that seems hard. I would like to. Um, would you? <laughs> well, I think it's going to be really hard because there's so many confounding factors, but I would say that by uh, sector, right? Like you can do, I can do it for insurance or I can do it for criminal justice in some small ways, but also economic projections are not, are different, a little different than what I do. And so I, I wouldn't want to try necessarily because I, um, I'm sort of against the future. Like, I don't want to project. <laughs> I'm really into the ground truth. Like, basically, I'm like, what is happening on the ground? Can't I quantify it? And that is my sort of sweet spot. And there are people who are really good at predicting the future and spinning out a, a story from the ground truth. But I'm sort of a specialist in the ground. Yeah. Don't you know they say you, you predict it by inventing it? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the price that we are paying is current yeah, for structural inequality. We are paying, yes, and I'm yeah. doing what I can. Let me yeah. just say, uh, I'm doing no, what it's, I can. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, so we have so to be, give behind, that to behind you. Behind you and yeah. then to Judith and then to uh, over. Thank you so much. Um, Joey, I'd like to actually come back to a point that you just made about data being able to be used in either way, right? And combine it with your point, Julia, about um, s solving or thinking about solvable problems. Because one thing that I keep thinking about, in particular as you make your suggestions, is how are data analysts trained nowadays, right? And I really see that as a, as a key component to actually a potential solution to the problem. Because if we obviously only train them in, you know, using data and maybe targeting it and tailoring it to the extent as, as they can, then we will never give them the opportunity to develop that conscience or that, that awareness of the wider implications. And to be honest, just as a sort of a side comment, as you were speaking about uh, the legal system, I would actually argue and sort of, I have a legal background, so <laughs> it's not that I'm speaking completely of, of uh, the top of my head, but I would argue that part of the problem is when you try to make the decision based on data. So when you basically have people in charge who think about how can we come to a solution 
based on the availability of data, then you get these weird outcomes. Well, if you think about, the other, think about it the other way around, in terms of what is it independent of the data, availability of data, that we want, then you can get different outcomes. So I think, to me, if I may make a suggestion, the solution would be to bring more social science education yeah. Yeah. to the data scientists. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I, sure, I definitely agree with that point. I mean, I, I look at it through the lens of journalism. And so in journalism, there's um, just, um, you know, because the profession is so underfunded and under pressure, but also because it's not really filled, people don't choose to go into it because of math literacy. It's only people like me who fell off the train somehow and <laughs> got there. So, you know, Journalists are too happy to receive, also to write about the available data, right? I always joke that there's like three clean data sets, base, baseball, the Fed, and polling, and wow, what is 538 write about, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like really easy to receive data sets and then make a visualization and write a hot take, and like it's not easy, but like it's something, right? But I believe we have to be artisanal and we have to basically collect our own data. We have to think, what I do is I think what question do I wanna answer and then I think about what data I have to go get. And it's a total nightmare every time. And my editors are like, why do all your stories take so freaking long? Well, uh, they're artisanal, so it takes a while. <laughs> I really like the idea of artisanal data. Um, <laughs> but I also think there's a, an interesting side to this work that's a little bit less unexplored. I was very struck in listening to the insurance piece because it seems that in a rational world, the insurance companies would not be doing anything like this because it would seem like it's costing them money to be treating people without equality. And so what I think you have also is a very, very interesting set of data to help us understand the motivations for some of these structural inequalities. And I think that that's a really important thing to understand because they're not just mistakes. You know, they're systemic things that people are doing that they intend to be doing. I think it's partly, certainly why you get so much pushback, like, okay, thank you for providing, for providing us with this data, and now let's put it in a drawer and go right. away. Um, and so I think, you know, one thing that comes out of it is you, know, you don't have to look at it across all of society, but you can basically say, okay, we can now understand how much are insurance companies willing to pay to be able to treat people unequally. And that's something we haven't right. really thought about in that way. What's its value to them? Why is it so valuable? Right. Is, it, is there some reason why it's economically valuable? Is it something that's not economic that they're doing? So I think that's an interesting piece of information to understand for itself. And I think it's also essential for understanding how we can change this. Because if we just look at fairness with the assumption that everyone's ultimate goal is to be fair and leave out trying to understand these motivations, we're yep. not going to make much progress. Right. I think you're right, although I suspect that what they've done is just raised, I mean, they're not actually going to lose money, right? So in order to give this discount, which I suspect is some sort of marketing cost in their mind, um, they've raised everybody's higher, right? So that that line that looks linear would have been a lower premium to begin with. But um, I agree with you, like the economic incentives are obviously what drive these decisions, at least on the for-profit company side of it, and it's definitely worth exploring. And I'm, I'm working on more stuff along that line right now. Yeah. And, it, and it may, some of it may not be economic. I mean, there's a woman whose name I've just spaced on who did a lot of interesting work on, she has a book called Pedigree, How Elite Companies Hire, which shows that you know, they will systemically make a lot of really, really poor hiring decisions because of just embedded beliefs of what kind of people they want there. So you may, it may uncover that they are doing things that are actually to their own economic harm, right. but it has to do with their view of the culture and society. It's not necessarily a good economic decision they're making. Right, and I suspect that that is true also. I mean, I don't, I haven't yet met anyone in the insurance industry who's led me to believe that there's like a person sitting there going, ah, ha, ha, I'm gonna figure no. out how to get these people, I'm gonna really screw them. I don't feel like that. I feel like it's a lot of well-intentioned people who don't, who are shocked, who were shocked. I wouldn't go as far as saying well-intentioned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them seem really nice. Okay, uh, uh, but <laughs> but um, although I will, have, I will say, um, they invited me to speak at their um, convention. I was like, why are you inviting me? The whole uh, industry's 
trade group. They have a meeting in Texas for all their top lobbyists, and they said, we want you to do a keynote. I was like, are you sure? And I asked like six <laughs> times, and I was like, I'm going to talk about the work. And they're like, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then I got there, and they said, send the slides the night before I fly in. And I give them the slides so they can load it up in the machine. And they were like, oh, we didn't know you were going to mention the names of companies. Because <laughs> it says Geico. Yeah, yeah. And they said, you can only speak if uh, you take the names out. So I didn't. I, I didn't withdrew. Speak. Yeah, and oh, I wow. sat in my hotel room above the ballroom and did a tweet storm during my supposed session trolling them um, <laughs> about how I wasn't <laughs> speaking. I was supposed to be on stage, and it was called ProPublica. Like, this whole talk was supposed uh. to be an interview with me. <laughs> but anyways, that wasn't your point at all. But um, <laughs> I do think, though, that um, I don't really believe... I, one thing that I think is a fallacy that sometimes is so easy and such a narrative that we all want to believe, which is like you find the bad person and mm -hmm. root them out, the one who's making this bad decision. And I think it's oftentimes not that. I don't think it's necessarily bad decisions. My guess is that it has to do with just fundamental understandings of risk yep. and just uh, societal st systemic assumptions about yep. what makes something risky. Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, here. Okay. Have a couple. Hi. So there seems to be an, an objective unfairness, and then there is the subjective feeling of unfairness that may or may not correlate or show up in a, in a visualization. And it seems quite clear that the system of Compass, for example, is being unfair, and at the same time that minorities in general feel they are being treated unfair by the judicial system. They don't really trust the judges or the, or the lawyers they're getting. Is there ever a consideration of, well, if there is this subjective component and there is a risk of, uh, for example, uh, breaching the fair trial uh, rights, why isn't a right, it a right of the accused to define whether or not these systems are put in place uh, since there is this subjective component of them having the right to, be, uh, to believe that they're being treated fairly, not only objectively, but subjectively? I'm not sure if I totally understand, but I'm going to answer what I think or want the question to be, which is um, right now the way our criminal justice system works is all the due process protections, which are the ones that you think of, of what is in, to design to embed fairness into the system, are only really required at trial. And nobody goes to trial, right? Pre-trial is really the only decision, and then you plea. And so there are very few trials. And so the due process requirement has been totally ignored during the pretrial phase. And so, for instance, people have argued that um, people should be able to contest their score during the pretrial and say, look, you know, it says I'm a seven, I'm a four. Now, the problem is I don't know what that debate looks like. I'm a four, I'm not a seven. How's the judge going <laughs> to adjudicate that, right? But at the very least, you could have the conversation. Um, or you could have some other way to embed that discussion of risk into that. But right now, the defendant really has very little rights to, to fight that battle about their, quote, riskiness. And so um, some of the issue is just how to build more due process into what is effectively the judgment phase now. Yeah, and I think, but there are some cases where, I think like in Wisconsin, where they try to use due process to go after uh, compass score being used in sentencing. And I think, yeah. and, 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 and to your point, they say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a secret, we can't tell you. Um, and and, it, and it, just, it doesn't make sense because you, you, couldn't, you couldn't say that if, if, you know. Well, the challenge is that um, the Compass challenge was, went on uh, due process is, I think, up at the Supreme Court now, um, but is, is that judges are really deferential to other judges. So essentially, every ruling so far on due process for risk assessment and scores has been like, you know what, judges can consider whatever they want in sentencing. Mm -hmm. They can just not like you and sentence you, right? Uh, Pre-trial judges can consider whatever they want. There's, sometimes there's a bond schedule where you have to follow, but most judges have extreme latitude. And when it's appealed, the judge above them is like, well, judges are awesome. <laughs> they should really get what they want. Uh, over Madar there? Madaris, or you, you're, I think Madaris had one, and then we'll go to Gifran, and then... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we at Media Lab have been working on uh, 
new cryptographic techniques that would let you fuse data sets in a privacy preserving way. For example, you could fuse together data sets that relate criminal history and data sets that relate mental health, that nothing about inter each data set gets revealed, but you still get utility out of it. Uh, and there is a natural question about weaponizing this, because normally what you could compute on, you could also FOIA, at least in, uh, in certain settings. And here, this ability for you to peek under what computation was done under the veil would no longer simply exist. Uh, can you share some of your thoughts of uh, uh, what would be it like to be doing investigative journalism in a future like this? Using homomorphic encryption? Using techniques like homomorphic encryption. Um, it's really difficult, right? So there's, um, I'm really in love with math, as you may have noticed. And so I love stories that are like, um, my friend uh, at Busby just did, um, they've done a couple of these like where statistically it's impossible that um, judges in figure skating are fair, right? The data shows that they're, they favor their own country in ways, it just, there's no way for it to be explained by, other than bias, right? But um, journalism is reluctant to, to do probabilistic findings, right? It's a difficult um, travel for me. Like, I have to produce those people, Otis and Ryan. Like, I have to have anecdotes. That is, like, what is the, that's the currency of journalism, is the narrative. And so, um, I love the idea of pioneering these, these areas where you're like, I can't see it, but I know enough to know. Um, but we're, I think mainstream journalism is not quite there yet. And then I asked Madars if I could actually steal it since I was here. Uh, so my question is, um, actuar actuarial science is really expanding in the age of big data. Um, and actuarial science is fundamentally based on this idea of risk. So my question is, is risk like fundamentally a reductionist neoliberal concept? <laughs> and if it is, um, is there an alternative concept that you'd like to see data science start to orient itself around for modeling purposes? Whew, um, <laughs> that's a hard one. I do think risk is often narrowly and politically defined, and people are unwilling to acknowledge that. Um, so I think that is true. Um, I still think it's useful in the sense that what I really love the most is the fact that I'm not expanding beyond the scope of risk, and I'm still showing these companies are not doing it, right? So I'm like, I came to your playing field, and I'm using your rules, and it's not, you don't have it going on, right? And so that to me is still the best proof, right? Like, I, I agree, there's definitely like other ways to have those fights, but for me, like, I like to win on the playing field of the opponent. <laughs> and can um, you throw it to this corner and then we'll throw it to the Oh, whoa, nice. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, so we're talking about uh, structure and kind of like how insurance companies like looked at uh, zip codes and determined how rates are based off that. But I was wondering um, kind of how they respond to any changes in the urban environment. For example, if the socioeconomic factors of an environment change and if um, the risk or the rates change over time in response to those factors and also like the economics, uh, as you were saying, how those correspond to those, those dynamics. I mean, the insurance companies are interesting because they are, you know, they were like kind of the first algorithm users, but they're sort of um, really old school because of that. So their systems are really legacy, so they kind of update their rates every couple years, right? And so every couple years they'll file a new thing, like, okay, this code has adjusted a little bit this way, and it's supposed to be based on the risk of, that they have seen in terms of what they've had to pay out in those zip codes. Now that data is secret. So all I can see is the average that everyone has paid out. But um, I, don't, um, I don't know, you know how well they're policing it because it feels like it's pretty disparate, right? The reality um, versus what they were charging, particularly like Geico was insane, right? So, so I just, I don't know 
um, how often, because they don't have much public scrutiny, I mean, they do file with the regulators, but what's interesting about the way the regulators look at it, they're not looking at this question, right? They're asking a very different question of the data, which is basically um, their main question for an insurance regulator, the only thing you care about is, do they have enough money to fund all the possible claims or are they gonna go under, right? So that's your main question as a regulator. Uh, and so they're not really looking at this question. So I don't know how often they check, and I believe that basically when people don't check their metrics, they fail to update them. <laughs> and then I think- In the back? Back. Okay. <laughs> so considering the fact that it might be very hard for us to get criminal justice systems to stop using this data uh, to make decisions based on what we think people might do in the future, do you think it's possible for us to start using this data to get criminal justice systems to repay defendants uh, for wrongs that the justice system has done to them in the past? To repay them. Um, can you expand a little bit on what you mean by that? Like pay them back their bail money or the time they lost from being in jail? So I know that some, like Canada and California are doing things like that for nonviolent drug crimes. So, you know, other things like that. Um, so yeah, or paying back bail money or somehow finding a way to, you know, it's a little hard to quantify, Correct. but finding some way to repay, you know, repay, uh, the, you know, the, the injustice that the justice system has done to a defendant that was wrongly labeled as very high risk and therefore, right. you know, not getting I mean, I think in generally I'm philosophically inclined towards reparations. Um, I think if you can quantify a harm and, um, and do right by the person who's been harmed, it's a good idea. And so um, I think it's, it's very complex in the details. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know if, what harm measurement would work in this case, but in many cases like torts and stuff, I think the harm is on what your potential income would be. And if you're a poor person, it'd be much lower than a rich person. Yeah. And that would be unfair as well. Um, I think, but, I, but I think it's interesting to figure out how you might do a retroactive uh, fairness um, and uh, yeah, and then and oh over continue. that way. Yeah, and this is she represents Twitter here. I think. Oh, okay, <laughs> hi there. Yes, yeah. so um, Twitter, I, the community, not the company. <laughs> I am Twitter. Um, I have a question from Twitter that I'm going to combine with a question of my own, if you don't mind. So, <laughs> CJ on Twitter asks, what's, "What's your best practice for being such a thorn in the side of justice systems or unjust systems <laughs> oh. that they have to listen to the data lobbed at them?" And I want to follow up on that by asking you about your experience with the backfire effect and this idea that people, when presented with facts and data about their biases or facts like climate change or racism, say, that's clearly not true. You've just reinforced my position to the opposite. I guess what I'm kind of asking is, do you read the comments on your articles? But oh, he's asking if right. you found a way to get through that. Okay, barrier. so first of all, I'd never read the comments. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, that's like my main best practice in life. <laughs> no comments. Um, so I have a whole jihad about how I do journalism, which I'll just give you like a short version of, which I believe that journalism has um, needs a guiding light. So for a long time, I was raised under this idea of objectivity was our guiding light, and that really just became false equivalence. And so. Everyone, I think, has sort of agreed that it's no longer good, but doesn't have a new lodestar. And I'm arguing, mostly shouting into the wind, that we should use the scientific method as our lodestar. It's, um, the scientific method is super nice because it's actually kind of like a little loosey-goosey when you really look at it. It's just like, do you have a hypothesis? Do you collect evidence for it? And then, you know, do you have reproducible results? That's your goal, right? And those are my goals, and that's how I run my investigations, is we come up with a hypothesis, and then we figure out what are the tools and data we need to test this. And mostly we do lots of testing. So I always tell this story about our research onto Amazon. Um, I'd heard that there was price discrimination on Amazon. If you used a mobile browser versus desktop, you would get different prices. So we set up all this big experiment in the cloud and we had all these Amazon accounts and we were running it for months and the data was just not there. It was like there was really no difference. So then we were like, but we saw something weird between Prime and non-Prime. So we were like, okay, let's test that. So we for months we're testing Prime versus non-Prime. Is there some difference in prices? No, sad. So, you know, uh, then I had given up on it. And three months later I went to the bar um, 
uh, with a guy who's an expert on antitrust, um, and he, I was, he was telling me about how terrible Amazon was to the booksellers, and I was like, yawn. And, <laughs> and then I was like, you know, I've been doing this test, but I can't figure, I, I just don't have anything. And he was like, oh, well, the thing you need to test is does Amazon advantage itself versus, when it's a seller versus third-party sellers? That's the test. So we went back and ran that, because we already had all the accounts set up. It was in the, cl it was in the Amazon cloud running away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, boom, immediate results, right? And that is like, I have seven of those going at any time, and most of them are total miserable is failures. This, is this legal? Oh, can we talk? Do we have to talk about <laughs> no, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, right. <laughs> Crank call. <no. laughs> we, we were sorry. just looking at prices <laughs> sorry, on it's Amazon. Okay, no, That's it's legal. Totally legal. Okay. <laughs> so I believe in the idea that you don't know what your story is until you've done the tests, right? Mm -hmm. And most journalists get a tip, and then they report out three anecdotes, and they're done. And then they go to the data desk and say, build me a visualization. And then those guys say, actually, you know what? The data doesn't support your anecdotes. And then they have a fight, and then the data guys get really sad, and then they quit. And you know that's what happens. And so I'm trying to build a new way of journalists and programmers working together. And my team is two programmers and a journalist. Um, and a researcher, and we are like four people. We work um, collectively from the beginning on these projects. And I mean, I, I, the, the, the is it legal part is only half a joke in <laughs> okay, that at, 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 at MIT, <laughs> we actually can't do a lot of the studies that we'd want to do because, and I'll just advertise this because I think people should, some people know about it, but there is a law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that was created after the War Games movie because everybody got afraid that people would hack into computers and it says that if you use a computer in a way that is against the intent of the person who runs a computer and it's online, that is a felony um, that will throw you in jail and terms of service has been deemed as a description of how the person wants you to use the computer. So if you go on to Facebook and try all these experiments, it could turn into a felony, and we've, we've seen cases of that, obviously. So, so it, it's interesting also how, and I'm, I'm actually gonna sort of name names, uh, you know, a lot of these companies who are really into trying to like, do the right thing, um, when it comes down to these laws, there's also um, the anti-circumvention law, which is that it's a felony to break copyright protection on anything. Um, except for a very small number of ex exceptions. So if you have a algorithm running on your computer, um, but it's, in, uh, it's protected, uh, you can't audit it. And, and these are all really stifling things for researchers. But you can imagine Hollywood doesn't want to loosen up copyright protections, and software companies and online companies don't want to loosen up your ability to get, um, research how their systems work. And, and, and the fact that a lot of people who talk about internet freedom and all this stuff don't talk about the fact that these laws are impeding research. I, I, I think it's sort of a shame. And yeah, I mean, they're not impeding my research, but... Um, Your research is all legal, but uh, other than... <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I, I do think it's something that we need to push against, because yeah. unless you push against it, it won't change. Um, but on that happy note, I'd like to... <laughs> um, thank you so much, Julie. This is really you. amazing. Thank you. <laughs>